Right. Tegan, are you are you ready um, to um, to take the floor? Hello. Yes. Thank you. I can I can go ahead. Please do. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'll just check if I have screen sharing capabilities, and it looks like I do. All right. Um, thank you. So before I begin my paper, um, I'd like to note that the content is a little bit different. Um, from the abstract that I originally submitted in 2020. Um, instead of focusing primarily on Rachmaninoff's pre-1917 concert tours, my revised paper now also considers um, the reception of his American career post-1917. Um, and I'd also like to thank the organizers of the conference for the opportunity to share my research today. Um, and I'd also like to thank Keenan Reeser um, for his presentation yesterday um, on aspects of Rachmaninoff's life between 1913 and 1917 uh, that may have influenced Rachmaninoff's activities in the post-1917 period. Um, this conference is actually just has just introduced me to Keenan's research and I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, delving more into it and seeing what other sort of um, resonances that there are between uh, my research and his. Okay, <clears throat> Sergei Rachmaninoff was a symbol of Russian national identity at home and abroad, both pre and post 1917. Yet his Russianness has never been without complication. In her book, Nietzsche's Orphans, Rebecca Mitchell illuminates a utopian musical vision embraced by a group of Russian Silver Age intellectuals who actively searched for a music composed by a Russian Orpheus that could transcend the broken state of modern society and unify the Russian people with a collective national identity. According to Mitchell, Rachmaninoff was a potential candidate to fulfill the role of musical savior. However, critics were divided on his suitability for the role and amid the conflicts of World War I and the 1917 revolutions, the utopic vision of music transforming Russian society crumbled in the face of a more dystopic reality. After Rachmaninoff was exiled from Russia in 1917, perspectives on his national cultural significance were similarly conflicted. As Mitchell discusses, many Russian emigres and Soviet citizens revered Rachmaninoff as an icon of a cherished yet long lost Russia. In contrast, Soviet public discourses criticized the composer as an obsolete remnant of the past with no place in a progressive society. In this paper, I will continue to probe the various national and cultural meanings ascribed to Rachmaninoff, focusing on his reception by European and American audiences as he traveled all over the West, eventually migrating to the US in 1918. As scholars of transcultural, international, and cosmopolitan musical activities have demonstrated, music has thrived within, across, and outside of national borders. Although movement outside the confines of the nation can significantly shape musical meaning, many scholars, including Bridget Cohen, have noted that the nation remains a controlling force in music historiography, masking musical activity that does not conform to rigid national categorizations. Musicology's predilection for nationalist narratives has been particularly strong in cases like that of Russia, formerly understood in music historiography as, per, as peripheral to the traditional Austro-Germanic center. As Richard Tereskin has argued, owing to the consistent evaluation of Russian music on the basis of its Russianness, uh, music historiography prevents, presents a severely limited conceptualization of Russian musical activity. My research supports the impetus to think beyond the confines of the nation by investigating the international critical reception of Rachmaninoff's pre-1917 concert tours abroad and his post-1917 American performance career. As I will show, Rachmaninoff's public image, as presented by the press, was not wholly determined by his Russian nationality. On the contrary, his image was shaped by a complex amalgamation of different factors, some of which embraced his Russianness, while others cut across and transcended national identifications, 
gesturing to a utopic vision of his universal greatness. For example, while critics were divided on just how Russian and what kind of Russian Rachmaninoff represented, they also routinely evaluated him in the context of broader spheres of musical activity, such as his status as a world traveling virtuoso, his contributions to the history of Western art music, and his position within a long standing musical lineage, the greatness of which was predictably inscribed in Germanic terms. By investigating Rachmaninoff's reception on the international stage, my paper contributes to rethinking rigid nation based categorizations in music historiography and resituating musical activity in transnational, international, and migratory spheres. Commentary on Rachmaninoff's Russianness appeared in press responses throughout his entire career. The kind of Russianness that Rachmaninoff embodied tended to divide critical opinion, trying, drawing on two different images of Russian national character. As discussed by Marina Filova Walker, in the 19th century, two stereotypical images of Russian national character developed the dark, melancholic, and tragic characterization, and the exotic, fantastic, and folk-inflected characterization. As Frilova Walker explains, these two images of Russianness traveled westward through translated Russian literature and the entrepreneurial musical activities of Sergei Diaghilev. Both characterizations presented themselves in the critiques of Rachmaninoff's first performance in Western Europe in London, 1899. During the concert, Rachmaninoff conducted his symphonic poem, The Rock. Critics were conflicted about both the amount and type of Russianness that the, that the orchestral work embodied. According to critics in the press, the work was tragically Russian owing to its fatalistic spirit, exotically Russian with its flashy orchestral tricks and Byzantine coloring, and finally not very Russian because of its debt to the symphonic poems of Liszt. This kind of conflicting commentary drawing on varied perceptions of musical Russianness persisted throughout Rachmaninoff's entire career. In 1907, Rachmaninoff made another major appearance in the West, this time in Paris as part of Sergei Diaghilev's Russian concert series. As described by Tereskin, the concerts, quote, catered conspicuously to hackneyed Parisian notions of quasi-Asiatic Slav exotica, end quote achieved through strong musical representation from the Mighty Five. Rachmaninoff performed his own second piano concerto and conducted his spring cantata. The French critics were consumed with discussing and evaluating Russian music in the context of its nationalist characteristics. Overall, Rachmaninoff was deemed to be more internationalist than nationalist, an opinion that attracted both condemnation and praise by French journalists. For example, Pierre Lalo wrote that Tchaikovsky, Rubinstein, Glazunov, Rachmaninoff, Tanyev, and others had succumbed to the German influence and by doing so effectively destroyed in Russian music all life, meaning, and purpose. In contrast, other critics framed the German influence as emblematic of a much needed force of artistic renewal in Russian music. The Russian concert series of 1907 was Rachmaninoff's one and only performance with Diaghilev, presumably because his music lacked the appropriate exotic Russianness to dazzle Parisian audiences. The notion of Rachmaninoff as a Germanized Russian composer followed him across the Atlantic for his first American tour beginning in the fall of 1909 and retained some currency after he immigrated to America in 1918. The press described him as Tchaikovsky's successor, as part of the new German group, and as drawing on German models and avoiding the nationalist style of the Mighty Five. Despite these identification of internationalist leanings, the Russian image of Rachmaninoff as a dark and melancholic figure resonated deeply and immediately with American critics and audiences. Reactions to the second and third piano concerto were particularly exemplary of this trend. Following a performance of the second concerto in St. Louis in 1920, the newspaper critic Richard Spamer described the work as musically manifesting the soul of Russia. 
Spamer and other critics also recognized that the Russianness they heard in the music of Rachmaninoff was different from that of the ordinary Russian. Rachmaninoff's Russianness was refined by means of his own aristocratic lineage, his status as a land-owning Russian, and his contact with Western musical culture. Many critics were also perhaps too quick to connect Rachmaninoff's musical melancholy with the traumas of revolution and exile. Even the prelude in C-sharp minor composed well over two decades before Rachmaninoff left Russia was called, quote, the solemn dirge of exile, end quote, by at least one critic. Despite the tendency for critics to wax poetic about Rachmaninoff's dark and melancholic Russian soul, Occasionally, he was described in much more exotic terms. For example, following a 1921 Chicago recital featuring some of the Opus 39 Etude Tableau, one reviewer described Rach Rachmaninoff and his music as fiery, colorful, bizarre, barbaric, and emanating from the Russian soil with specific breath to the country. Finally, there were those who were less confident about Rachmaninoff's thorough Russianness. A critic writing in the New York Evening Post in 1923 declared that Rachmaninoff's lack of Russianness was a marker of his universal humanity. Quote, Rachmaninoff, indeed, is the most mystifying Russian of them all, because we believe he is so much more than merely Russian. Rachmaninoff seems to be really extraterritorial. You are scarcely conscious that he is Russian at all in what he does, but just human, greatly human. The amalgam in this case is one of sympathy, imagination, skill, profound and universal, end quote. The notion of Rachmaninoff achieving a kind of universal greatness represents a different kind of utopian idealization that was also quite common in the press and provides an interesting counter perspective to the image of him as embedded in the Russian soil and embodying the Russian soul. In the Oxford History of Western Music, Tereskin describes Rachmaninoff as someone whom many believe to be the greatest living composer because his style was highly distinctive yet based on traditional styles. In a later essay, Tereskin reveals that this assessment of Rachmaninoff was inspired by a set of Schirmer lithographed portraits gifted to him as a child called the Great Composers. As Tereskin recalls, the collection contained portraits of the regular suspects. Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, Haydn, Schubert, Schumann, Chopin, Wagner, and Verdi. The last of the great composers, however, was not one of the regulars. It was Rachmaninoff. While Tereskin uses this story to argue that Rachmaninoff was, quote, the most effective anti-modernist standard bearer, end quote, it also gestures to another important aspect of Rachmaninoff's identity in the public eye, at least from an American perspective. This aspect situated him as an active and contributing member to the center of Western European musical culture, complicating music historiography that paints Russian music as a fundamentally nationalist tradition on the periphery of Western art music. Rachmaninoff's utopic and universal status as one of the greats of Western music history was made explicit in the many advertising campaigns that he was featured in for companies such as Steinway and the American Piano Company and Piano. The advertisement expressed Rachmaninoff's present day relevance, an awareness of his contribution to the history of Western art music, as well as his universal appeal. As discussed by Ekaterina Kuznetsova, the Steinway campaign called Instrument of the Immortals attracted consumers by positioning the Steinway as the piano of choice of all great composers throughout history. One particular version of the ad from 1923 specifically capitalized on the progress narrative of music history with a slight reorientation to center the development of the Steinway piano rather than the development of musical style and to culminate with Rachmaninoff, not as a Russian romantic, but as the most recent link in a chain of great Western art music pianists and composers. So I'll share uh, this ad with you now. The, 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 the ad reads, quote, 
that the truth is that the history of the Steinway is an endless story of artistic progress. Although the first piano made by Henry Steinway was to Liszt and Wagner perfection, though Berlioz and Rubinstein chose it above all other pianos, yet even to these immortal dreamers, it was not, for, it was not given to foresee the Steinway whose tone and action or beauty Franz Liszt never could have imagined. Paderewski and Rachmaninoff speak through the Steinway that is far greater than the one that so delighted Richard Wagner. This 1922 Ampico advertisement untethers Rachmaninoff from national moorings and raises him to a level of profound musical and worldly significance. Quote, a, a musician becomes universally significant only when he has transcended the limitations of race or environment. Sergei Rachmaninoff is a Russian by birth, but his music partakes of the entire world and its all-inclusive appeal is inevitable. From the famous prelude, which was the interpret, sorry, which was the inspiration of his extreme youth, to the monumental symphonies and concertos of his maturity, Rachmaninoff has possessed the unfailing instinct for the human note. End quote. The discourses surrounding Rachmaninoff's historical placement among the greats of Western art music also surfaced in discussions of specific compositions such as his choral symphony, The Bells, and Rhapsody on a Theme of Paganini, a set of 24 variations for piano and orchestra based on the theme of Paganini's 24th Caprice. The Bells was premiered in America on February 6, 1920 with the Philadelphia Orchestra alongside his third piano concerto. Owing to the work's symphonic proportion and its inclusion of vocal forces, Critics evaluated the work in comparison to Mahler's Symphony No. 8 and Beethoven's Symphony No. 9. In February 1920, The Bells was performed for the first time in New York at Carnegie Hall. This time, instead of an all-Russian, all-Rachmaninoff program, The Bells was framed with two works by Beethoven, beginning with the Leonardo Overture No. 3 and ending with Beethoven's Choral Fantasia for piano, chorus, and orchestra. According to a New York critic, quote, the juxtaposition of the two compositions provided a sharp contrast and incidentally proved how far music, primarily orchestral music, has enlarged its power of expression during a century of growth, end quote, directly connecting Beethoven and Rachmaninoff within the same developmental path of orchestral music. Rhapsody on a Theme of Paganini received its world premiere on November 7, 1934 in Baltimore, Maryland. In the press, critics linked the work to a great diversity of works, composers, and traditions within Western art music history. Numerous critics noted that Rachmaninoff was contributing to a very specific tradition of thematic borrowing, which placed him in the company of Brahms, Schumann, and Liszt. Unsurprisingly, most critics also linked the work and Rachmaninoff to the demonic virtuoso himself, Paganini. And there is much evidence to suggest that Rachmaninoff explicitly drew on the mythology surrounding Paganini while composing. Three years after Rachmaninoff composed the Rhapsody, he suggested it to Michel Fokin, a Russian dancer and choreographer, as the music for a ballet about the Paganini legend, the violinist who had sold his soul to the devil in order to obtain superhuman powers of technical virtuosity. Rachmaninoff described in significant detail a program for the ballet pitting the Paganini spirit represented by the Paganini theme against an evil spirit represented by the Dies Irae. Critics mused on the work's diabolical associations, linking it to the Paganini legend, as well as Liszt's set of Dies Irae variations, Dance of the Dead. In addition to composing like the giants of Western art music, critics claimed that Rachmaninoff played like them too. Concert reviews often characterized him, characterized him as embodying the spirits, the spirits of composers such as Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, Chopin, and Liszt, in his performance of their works. He was also drawn into close association with these past masters as the only living musician to carry on the tradition of the composer virtuoso, someone who excelled at both composition and performance. 
In terms of the present world of virtuoso performers, Rachmaninoff was frequently ranked alongside Fritz Kreisler, Joseph Hoffman, and Ignacy Paderewski. In some instances, such comparisons led to the belief that Rachmaninoff was so unique that he simply could not be classed with any other virtuosos. Following a 1921 Boston concert, critic F Philip Hale claimed, quote, this pianist is of no school, a man not to be jauntily classified. His personality, apparently exerted unconsciously, is singularly authoritative. His individuality as an interpreter is indisputable. Not that he Rachmaninoffizes the compositions of others, but in a measure he recreates their music, end quote. As I have exemplified in my analysis of Rachmaninoff's reception abroad, both pre and post 1917, the question of Rachmaninoff's Russianness was a highly complex issue. To many, he was the perfect manifestation of the melancholic Russian. To others, he was fiery, bizarre, and exotic. Still, there were those who claimed that his music was completely devoid of nationalist characteristics and instead represented a Germanized compositional trend which, per, which was perceived as Russian music's downfall by some and yet its savior by others. Some viewed Rachmaninoff as transcending his national identification to embody a more utopic universal humanity exemplified in and in his reception as a performer and composer, which linked him to a diversity of different composers, performers, and musical traditions. In opposition to music historiography that positions Russian music as an essentially national tradition, the American press judged Rachmaninoff against those considered most central to Western music history at the time and positioned his compositions as major contributions to the development of Western art music. Thank you. All right, uh, we have, do we have any questions or comments? Maria. Um, thank you very much. Just curious, how much do you think the sort of um, transnationalism, globalization of Rachmaninoff's image through the American press is driven by, um, firstly, impresarios who need a name that will you know, not be a freak, but actually be something that is going to relate to the ordinary person in every state and every country. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, purely by like the, the aggressive Steinway marketing machine. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Maria, for your question. Um, and I think it, it yes, it, it most likely was uh, driven to, you know, a very, driven um, to a very high degree. Uh, by this kind of need to, you know, to bring in the money to, you know, to advertise. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's hard to know for sure. Um, and unfortunately, one of the things that I'm missing in my, my research, so I've basically all of, all of this is based on um, analysis that I've done of um, reviews in, in newspapers and music journals, and, and then of course the advertising campaigns I've looked at. Um, my other intention was also to look at uh, personal correspondence and basically fan, fan literature, fan mail to Rachmaninoff to try and get another sort of you know, inside angle about what people really thought about him. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic has, has disallowed me from, from getting to the letters. Um, I was at the Rachmaninoff archive in um, the Library of Congress in November 2019. And I collected all the newspaper stuff and, and the advertising materials. And then my intention was to return um, to, to go back to, um, to, get, to get the materials from the letters, but I, I haven't been able to do that. Um, and, so I, I, and so it's hard for me to tell basically because my, my entire analysis is based on, on these reviews and, and the advertising campaign. So, I mean, my guess would be, would be yes, um, for sure. Uh, but I don't, um, I, I don't sort of have that, that um, insider perspective, you know, from, from just sort of like regular people and thinking about, you know, what, what they thought about him <laughs> as I'm well. Just, I'm, I'm just interested because Rahman notoriously, you know, very much he divorcing himself in every possible way from, from anything other than Russian. Um, mm -hmm. Whether the Hollywood stuff also plays into it, because I mean, if you look at both the British filmmaking industry mm -hmm. um, and their preoccupation with um, portraying all these films about the 
uh, the Russian Revolution and sort of dancing Cossacks and all the stereotypes, but also America feeding into those same mm -hmm. um, storylines and mm -hmm. stereotyping mm -hmm. there. But then the, the Rachmaninoff style music, I mean, notoriously, yeah, all these composers employed to write something like Rachmaninoff because it was so popular. Mm -hmm. um, whether the, the Hollywood need mm -hmm. for that to be seen as um, oh, an American trait, an English, uh, yeah. trait rather than a Russian trait whether that also starts to play into it somehow because I, I know initially in, in, in the British filmmaking industry the the Rachmaninoff style music was always you know for the stereotyping of, of the, the characters um, mm -hmm. but then if you look now at lots of film music you still get Rachmaninoff style stuff filtering and got nothing to do with Russia yeah um, yeah so, so whether there's um yeah, I, I think film music um, and the Hollywood angle uh, plays plays into this a lot too. And there was, um, that's sort of um, an area of this that I'm hoping to pursue next. Um, and I've done a little bit of dabbling. Um, probably one of the sort of both funniest and, and sort of um, a, a one example that really kind of places it, places him in an American context is there's a, um, a Walt Disney cartoon with Mickey Mouse and he's like performing the C-sharp minor prelude. And, uh, and I, I really thought that is sort of like, you know, a really sort of quintessential, almost Americanization, you know, of Rachmaninoff's image. And, and I think there was a, a sort of impetus to kind of um, treat him as being like, oh, he's ours now, you know, like he's our great, um, great, amazing performer, you know, who's, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry, I, ho I, I hope that answered uh, your question partially, at least. <laughs> I'm also thinking about things like um, the Yellow River Concerto and, and all, all those sort of fake Rachmaninoff bits <laughs> are, are marketed as very global exports and whether mm -hmm. the need to see them as global mm -hmm. like, somehow interact with how people, because yeah. I mean, I, I don't see Rachmaninoff ever saying I'm an American, I just I, no, I yeah, that, so. and and there really wasn't, I know, like, there's been sort of, um, uh, I think the sort of closest, you know, kind of statement regarding that was when he did finally decide to become a, an American citizen. Um, and he, and I mean, even then, I, he, you know, he didn't really say anything like, you know, I'm, I'm an American and I'm, you know, dis disregarding my Russian roots or anything like that. Because yeah, in, in a lot of the interviews that he gave throughout his career. He's very and, choreographed the other way around, doesn't it? It's, it's yeah. all that, it's I'm unwillingly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just, yeah, being not being able to return home, like I'm a Russian without my roots, you know, and all this kind of like that kind of rhetoric, it was very popular in, in his interviews. So, um, so yeah, and, and I think, um, like, it was so, so common for, um, for advertise uh, sort of um, announcements of his concerts and advertisements to bill him as like the greatest composer in the world, you know, the greatest pianist, like uh, the heir, you know, or, or rival to Paderewski and like, and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and I think that was probably also um, like uh, motivated by sort of um, like financial and kind of business decisions and marketing and all that kind of stuff to make Americans think like, oh, like he's, you know, we have the greatest composer and we have to go see him. <laughs> and mentioning Pedretti might be interesting for you in that he's also another composer that Hollywood really latched onto. So mm -hmm. um, most of the movies, the, the concerts, they're all mm -hmm. staged. So if you find on YouTube Pedrovsky stuff, it's all studio stuff from America. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a look for sure. Thank you. Thank you. David. Yeah, thank you for your, your really wonderful paper. It's it's always just wonderful to, to see research being done about Rachmaninoff. Um, <laughs> I was really struck by um, one of the reviews where um, they described uh, Rachmaninoff, uh, his Russianness as his race. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not really something I see in Russian periodicals or musical press of the time is talking about, you know, specifically r race in that way. That seems pr an Amer to be an American thing. But I'm, I'm wondering if, um, and I, I may not have the, the years quite right, but it, it sounds a little bit like the discourse um, you know, in the 30s of the Harlem Renaissance um, of, and still the way that some of the historiography of William Grant still is portrayed. And I'm wondering if um, there's any connection between those, uh, the sort of discourse of sort of naturalizing um, European um, immigrant composers mm -hmm. with sort of the language of, of racial integration um, within uh, North America. 
Um, I actually, I haven't found much about that at all. The, I guess Philip Ross Bullock is, is not here, is he? <laughs> is, um, he, in some of his uh, literature on the British reception of, of Russian music, he gets into the idea of race, um, specifically like Hubert Perry at the, um, the uh, RCM and stuff like was um, kind of couching, couching um, like the discussion of sort of like Russian characteristics in, in terms of race um, and, you know, saying it's like, you know, the Slavic style or, you know, the, the racial style. And, and um, so that sort of, a, that played, I feel a larger part actually in his English reception. Um, I haven't seen it as much in the American reception, but that's definitely not to say it's not there. Like I, um, there, there's just so much, <laughs> there's so much, uh, so many reviews and so much uh, literature on this out there that, um, that it's possible, you know, I just haven't come across it yet, but, um, but yeah, it's definitely something I'll keep an eye out for and keep thinking about as I, as I continue looking at these reviews. Are there any questions or additional comments? Sorry. It might also be worth making parallels with other Russian immigrants who, the ones that tended to sort of drop out into obscurity that are sort of finding the line right now, like, like uh, Luria and mm -hmm. they, they never managed to make themselves be recognized as American citizens. But the ones that are very famous, like Stravinsky, mm -hmm. they were very good at making themselves not just Russian, but, but something mm -hmm. else. So I don't know whether when you're doing your further research, it might be interesting to tessellate the sort of the emigres that have yeah. not managed to become American. Yeah. The ones that have, and whether that actually is a narrative that maybe we're overlooking in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I think that would be a really productive angle to, to pursue. Um, and I have, I, um, I have looked quite a bit into the reception of Zelotti, like when he was traveling in, in England first, it kind of like, I, I at first I, I started looking into him because he was almost like the precursor to Rachmaninoff and also introduced, you know, the, the world to the C sharp minor prelude and, and this kind of stuff. And, um, uh, and yeah, and I don't think he sort of gained sort of a, a true kind of, or he, he never sort of became as famous as, as Rachmaninoff, of course. Um, but one, one sort of interesting thing that I found in his reception was that he was, um, uh, the connection between him and Liszt like was very strong. And I think that's, that's how he was um, kind of advertised and envisioned in the press. Um, a lot of the time, you know, he was often billed as Liszt's favorite pupil. And so that sort of connection, you know, from one great virtuoso to the next, and it, and it came up a little bit in Rachmaninoff's reception too, and that he's the next one, you know, it went from Liszt to Zelotti to Rachmaninoff, this, um, I guess, pedagogical lineage. Um, so yeah, uh, but yeah, I, I would uh, for sure um, look at look at others as well, especially more in the American con context. I know like Zelotti made his way there as well, but um, I haven't really looked at him beyond sort of the English reception. I had a quick um, comment, and it's, it's not quite fully formulated yet. Um, the you know I was I was listening to you, and you know you mentioned standard historiography mm -hmm. and. I was actually thinking, you know, I mean, we have two different historiographies, right? There's the critical reception, right? People who review these performances in the newspapers mm -hmm. and they construct one kind of narrative. And then there's mm -hmm. the academic historiography. And mm -hmm. these things are extremely different. Yes. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like we need to either emphasize these differences or try to find a way to reconcile them somehow. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I just wants to put that thought out there. Yeah, no, thank you. And um, uh, and that's sort of what, what was part of what um, inspired my work on this project was because I, I found that, um, and actually Keenan Reeser's, his, his dissertation, he traced the reception of Rachmaninoff in all like encyclopedias and dictionaries. So, you know, like Grove and, and what have you, uh, and found that he he was routine, routinely criticized as being not or being too cosmopolitan and not being Russian enough. So in this sort of more academic, you know, reception. Um, and so and I'm finding almost well, not not the opposite, but I'm seeing sort of his if you want to call it that his cosmopolitanism as being praised as like a, you know, a, a virtue, right, and that he's able to um, appeal to, you know, the entire world, <laughs> apparently. Um, and so that's sort of what I wanted to show Whereas historiography gives us one story I'm looking at, you know, the people who are actually listening to him perform during his lifetime, we're seeing it, you know, from a, from a very different perspective, I think. Great. Thank you. If there are Thank no you. further questions, let's uh, let's stop here. Another round.